And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are going to go ahead and get started with our 3.30 presentation for floodplain information. Um, FEMA is, has released some preliminary flood insurance study and rate maps. Uh, the maps are on the wall. I know several of you were looking at them as you came in. Um, so welcome. How many of y'all are real estate professionals? Show of hands. So about half and half? OK. Um, any surveyors or engineers? No? Property owners? Yeah, OK. Great. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about floodplain administration, why we do it, what the city and county's roles are. Uh, we'll t go over some basic you know, floodplain terminology, just make sure we're all on the same page and we know what all the colors on the maps are. Um, we will go over some major areas of change um, around the county, some various resources for you guys to look at, um, you know, at your leisure or if you have clients or friends or family or even yourself are trying to find information later, some great resources for you, uh, and impacts to property owners, business owners, and things as a real estate professional you might need to know. All right, so the goals of floodplain administration, at the end of the day, we are looking at ensuring the health, safety, and economy of the community. Uh, we want to improve the safety of people and animals. Those animals can be pets, they can be livestock. Um, however they are important to you, they are important to the community. We are looking to lower the amount of damaged property and reduce economic losses accrued as a result of damaged property. All right, so the city and county's role in accomplishing those goals, um, we adopt and implement ordinances that meet or exceed the National Flood Insurance Program. And we will go a little bit more into detail um, on the National Flood Insurance Program here in a little while. Uh, we review all development and flood prone areas and issue permits accordingly. That is one of the main reasons we are having this meeting, is so that you know if property is in a flood-prone area. We coordinate with local, state, and federal officials. Floodplains are regulated from local government all the way up to federal government, and so we like to make sure that all of our rules and ordinances and regulations are, are all in sync with one another and it all ties together. All right, we balance economic gain of floodplain development against resulting increase in flood hazards. What that means is you are more likely to sustain damage the closer you are to the creek that floods or the river that floods. Okay, so you're gonna have a higher level, generally speaking, you have a higher level of regulation the closer you are to those creeks. We communicate risk to citizens. Uh, we have all of the information that we are talking about today on the city and county websites. Um, all of this is on FEMA websites, um, you know, and we, the city has a social media page. I know we've put some information out on that and, and other things. So we wanna make sure that everyone is aware of the risk and knows what they're looking at and has resources to make decisions. We regulate and guide development to minimize risk. We adopt standards in the more flood prone areas and enforce them. We plan for evacuation, public service impacts. Right? We have hazard mitigation plans that cover the entire county. Um, what do we do in a big event? You know, what evacuation routes do you have? What are the flood readiness stages? Are we cleaning out the creeks? Are we making sure the culverts are unblocked? All of those steps help reduce damage. And we identify mitigation opportunities. Um, you know, the, the city and county do a lot of studies trying to get better information. That way we can more accurately regulate. You know, we don't want to over-regulate, but we do want to regulate appropriately so that property and community is safe. Why do we do this? Texas is in the top three for flood damage in the U.S., um, particular to Bastrop. It's very prone to riverine and shallow flooding. Uh, there are a lot of local drainage challenges. Um, we've had 10 declared disasters in the last 10 years, half of which are water related, four floods and Hurricane Harvey. Um, 
The National Flood Insurance Program allows property owners to get flood insurance. If we don't participate, if we don't have regulations that meet the minimum standards, you won't be eligible for flood insurance. Um, and we also provide updated maps uh, that FEMA puts out so that you know the areas of impact. So more about the National Flood Insurance Program. I'm gonna hand it over to Abram from Bastrop County. He is quite adept at explaining this one. Howdy, everybody. Uh, my name's Abram Barker. I'm the Floodplain Administrator for Bastrop County. And I have a ge geology background. I have a bachelor's from A&M, a master's from University of Arkansas. And uh, I love rocks, I love dirt. I played dirt when I was a kid. And back in 2002, some of y'all might remember this, there was a big flood around the 4th of July that flooded Canyon Lake. And it scoured out the spillway over 100 feet deep. Okay, I was camping at the time in an old army tent, and I got to watch the water flow underneath my tent for a week. And I can tell you, I became very familiar with what it's like to live in floodwaters during that time. So, why do we have the National Flood Insurance Program? It is the mechanism that FEMA uses to distribute all disaster-related funds, okay? So that's a wildfire, that's a tornado, that's a hurricane. You name, you name a major natural disaster, the funds are gonna be passing through the National Flood Insurance Program. It doesn't make a lot of sense at first, but that's the way FEMA is operated, okay? And so when we take a look at that, every, most of the counties in the United States participate in the program, even if they're out in a desert, because they might have a wildfire and they wanna be able to access those funds, okay? We've been very fortunate in that we've been a part of the program for a long time, and we've been able to take advantage of those funds to be able to help the community and, and the county and the city to stay afloat, so to speak. Uh, okay, so one other thing that we, another thing that we have done is we have adopted higher standards. Higher standards means above and beyond the absolute minimum that people have to build to. Case in point, freeboard. So when somebody builds a home in a 100-year floodplain or a zone A, zone AE floodplain, and they have to get that elevation certificate, that lender for the buyer is going to be looking for that elevation certificate to determine that base flood elevation to determine how high that house needs to be. So your, your buyers are going to be wondering, okay, how high do I have to build? Is this going to be a stilt house or is this just going to be five foot of fill on a slab on grade? Okay, so that's how this fits in because we have a plus two foot on the base flood elevation. So if you look at these firm maps back here and you see the numbers on them, it might be 371.8, it might be 340.0. It's going to have, you're going to have to think, okay, I need to add two foot to that, and then they're going to have to get the elevation certificate from a professional engineer or a licensed surveyor, and we're going to get into that a little later. I'm jumping the gun a little bit. I get excited about this stuff, you know. And so those are higher standards. The Texas Water Code, that's another body of regulation that basically says even if you're outside the floodplain, you can't impact your neighbors, okay? So if, the, if you have a creek on the back of your property and you say, hey, well, I'm just gonna fill it all in and then push it over to my neighbors, can't do that, can't do that, okay? Because then what happens is that, that neighbor sues you, okay? And they have, by the Texas Water Code, they have every right to do that and they're gonna win, okay? Okay, this is a scary statistic. And this is where all of you realtors come into play. Only 6% of homes in the floodplain in Bastrop County have flood insurance, okay? That 6% has paid out 
$3.6 million in claims. So think about the other 94% who didn't get claim money. What are they doing? Okay. So that also, that, that also tells me something else. That 94% of homes in a floodplain don't have a lender. Okay. These are cash only. These are the ones that say for sale by owner. Okay, because they know a lender's not going to cover them, a bank's not going to give them the money that they need to be able to sell or build. Okay, so as a realtor, if you've got a cash deal, you need to let them know hey, you're in a floodplain. You probably, even though it's not required for you, you probably need to get flood insurance because if you don't, when that house floods, and, and I was just talking with a lady, her house has flooded four times in the past six or eight years. Okay, every time her house floods, and was it her son? I think it was her son was there. He, he's 10 now, okay? And every time it rains, he grabs his backpack, puts all of his valuables in it, and puts it on top of the dresser because... He's that concerned. It's, it's programmed into his brain. It's going to flood my house every time it rains. Okay, we want to avoid that. We want to educate people to say, get the flood insurance, think ahead, do your due diligence. Okay? I couldn't believe it until she told me that, and that was just 10 minutes ago. Okay? So, over, on a national average, over 60% of homes that flood... Okay, just think about Hurricane Ida just recently. Think about Katrina, Rita. Over 60% of homes outside of the floodplain flood. So what does that mean? The maps only help you to a point. You need to have some common sense. You need to have some due diligence. If there is a creek next to the house, it's, might be, it might be a risk of flooding there. Okay, and so as realtors, as you're walking through these properties and you're looking around, of course you're looking at the house, you're trying to figure out how to beautify this house, but also look around you, okay? Is there a bunch of really kind of wetland cattails type, a bunch of big elm trees? Is there a creek nearby? Is there something that's gonna tell me, hey, this, this might be a low-lying area, this place might have flooded before. If you're a selling agent, ask, the, the seller, has this home flooded before? Okay? Because everybody is due the due diligence and the, the upfront about a property. The last thing property owners want to hear about after they close on a house is that it's flooded three times and that they can't, that they're going to spend $15,000 in flood insurance that they didn't know they were walking into, okay? And that's annual, not monthly, annual. Some, some of the highest rates in the nation right now are $45,000 a year on flood insurance. So if we can help the property owners to see what the risk is, it's going to save you, it's going to save them, and they're going to thank you for 30 years from keeping and getting, from, from getting into that home. Okay. Another thing to consider is every presidential de disaster declaration only opens up money for people to live while they recuperate from the disaster. It doesn't actually give you the money to rebuild. Flood insurance is the money that, that the government provides to rebuild. So if you go and you say, I was in Hurricane Harvey and... I want some money, they're going to say, okay, you get $5,000. And then you say, well, where's the rest of it? And then they have to explain, it's not for the rebuild of your house. That is for you to survive while you're rebuilding your house. Okay. Another thing to consider on flood insurance is that you can get contents coverage. You can cover multiple structures, not just the home. It depends on the structure. Uh, pools are not typically covered, okay? 
Uh, you can get up to $250,000 in coverage on a home. You can get up to half a million on a business. If you have a condo, and condos are kind of an up-and-coming thing here in the county. I've just started hearing rumors about a few recently. There's a whole separate program for them, and you can get flood insurance on a condo. Okay? So here's the next big thing, and, and y'all are really going to want to pay attention to this later, is the risk rating 2.0. Risk rating 2.0 is going to fundam fundamentally changes how flood insurance premiums are calculated. Okay, it's no longer about are you in or out of the floodplain. They're doing away with that entirely. Okay. So uh, a few basics on floodplains, mapping, base flood elevations, am I high enough? Okay if you don't mind grabbing that report there. She's going to show up this report. This is the flood insurance report. Okay, This report is what we would call the guts of a, a mapping project. Okay, What you see on the wall the flood, with the floodplain maps, those flood insurance rate maps, those are just products to help supplement that report. Okay. That report contains everything from what data they used, when it goes into effect, uh, what areas are affected, if there's been a letter of map revision on the, in the area, are they going to accept it again? Okay, it has a lot of really good information. It also identifies the base flood elevations. You're going to see the base flood elevations there on the maps that's not the base flood elevation that we regulate to, okay? It's the one in the report. The one in the report changes constantly throughout the, the course of the stream, okay? So the, the labels you're going to see on the maps give you a rough estimate, but they are not what we actually look at. So if you say, hey, I'm looking, the surveyor has, the property owners worked with the surveyor, they give you the elevation certificate, and then you realize it's not the same thing I saw on the map. Why is that? It's because they went to the report. Okay? The report is what goes. All right. So I know some of y'all have had the constant struggle of regulatory floodways. And we're going to talk a little bit about regulatory floodways and how they're different from the the standard 100-year floodplain, okay? Another thing to consider are repetitive loss areas, okay? This is kind of a new thing we're trying to get more publicity out about. These are areas where we know have flooded in the past. Most of them are not in the floodplain, okay? Um, so things to consider in this study is that it does not cover the entire county. It only covers parts of the county, okay? And that's because we've been doing some uh, special mapping projects in conjunction with the state of Texas and the Wa Texas Water Development Board to be able to provide more accurate information to get better maps, okay? Okay, so when you look on the wall there, you're going to notice there's three colors, okay? You've got your orange, your blue, and the red striping, okay? The orange is the 500-year floodplain. We do not regulate to it. It's the 0.2% annual chance flood, okay? That's basically stating there's a 0.2% chance that this property may have some water on it, may flood, in a particular year, okay? When we go to the blue, that's the zone A, zone AE, zone AO. If it has an A in it, that means we regulate to it, okay? So if it's blue, it's a regular, it's a 100 year floodplain, it's a regulated floodplain in Bastrop County and city of Bastrop. 
Now, I know y'all have properties that are not in Bastrop County. They're not in the city of Bastrop. They might be in Travis County. They might be Austin. They might be Cedar Park. Okay? They're all going to have different regulatory rules. And so, city of Austin might regulate to the orange. They might regulate to the 500-year floodplain. But then you go out into Travis County, and they might not. Okay, and so becoming familiar with the different jurisdictions you're dealing with is going to pay off dividends to you in, in the long run to be able to give good information to your clients. Okay. All right. So we talked a little bit about the 1% annual chance flood, the, a.k.a. the 100-year flood. Uh, how many of y'all were here for Hurricane Harvey? Okay. Did y'all know that was a 100-year storm here? That was the 100-year flood? Okay. In Houston, that was like a 1,000-year flood. But here, it was a 100-year flood. Okay. So if, you, if you're familiar with the, the properties that you were dealing with at that time, if you think about the damage that you saw at that time, that's going to give you a good indication of if you've got a good property or a bad property. Okay, and when you look at those base flood elevations, it's what we thought that Hurricane Harvey type flood got up to, and that's what the models suggested at, when they mapped the firm maps, okay? And what I found is that they're pretty close. Not, it's not 100%, these maps are not 100% accurate for if you were to go out there and, and you, you've got boots on the ground and you said, okay, I know the water went here, but it didn't go here, these are not going to be 100%. Okay, it's the best that FEMA could do. And you're going to have property owners that are going to say, well, I'm in a floodplain and I've never flooded in a day in my life. And, there, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, what that tells me is that the floodplain needs a little better mapping. Okay, and that's what we're trying to do as a county, as a city. Okay, how many of y'all have tried to sell properties along Riverside Drive in Tahitian Village? Okay, how about along Cedar Creek? Okay, so sounds like you've had to deal with the brunt of, of the regulatory floodway challenge. Yes. Okay, for those who are not familiar with the regulatory floodway, essentially this is what it is. When it floods, there's an area where the water is deep, where the water flows fast. Okay, when FEMA mapped out the 100-year floodplain, they did this modeling to figure out, okay, where is it going to be deep, where is it going to be fast, where is it going to cause the most damage, and we're going to call that the regulatory floodway. When, and then everybody goes, well, what's that? Okay. And what that does is they say, we're not going to say you can't, but we're going to make it really hard. Okay. Because what you got to do is they say, you can't put a new house. You can't put in anything new unless you do a full hydraulics and hydrology engineering study through an engineering firm. And I can tell you, those are not cheap. Okay. But what it does is it makes them go, ooh, do I really want to do this? Okay. But then also what it does is it says, FEMA, that they're, from an engineering standpoint, they have done their due diligence to say what we have done, what we propose to do, is going to meet the requirements. It's going to be protected. It's not going to cause the base flood to increase so that if I build my house here and my neighbor who was fine five years ago, now he floods. Okay, That's what we're trying to avoid. And by making those property owners go through that hydraulics and hydrology engineering study, that's what we ensure, okay? But 
a lot of property owners, they say, this looks beautiful. It's right on the golf course. I got this beautiful view of the Colorado River. How much? And then you go, it's in a regulatory floodway. And they go, what? And then you have to explain it to them. And then they go, oh. Or they buy it because they don't know. And then they find out afterwards. And they say, we want to build this nice, beautiful home right here. And we go, sorry, Charlie. You have to do a hydraulics and engineering study first. And then they go, what's that? And then we have to explain it to them. And then they find out, well, what can I do with this property? Okay. And then we say, well, you can keep it for the lizards and the snakes. Okay. <laughs> and then we set up this vicious cycle. Okay. Where they say, I want out of this property as fast as possible. Realtor, please sell this property. Sell it. And you say, okay, great property. Beach, practically beachfront property in Texas, right? And, and then, depending on the realtor, and I hope none of y'all have done this, is you say, yep, yeah, it's great, no problem. You can build on it, everything. And then you set up the next buyer for the exact same problem, okay? And then they're going to be cursing your name for 30 years. So let's not have any of that, and let's get educated, okay? So this is a little bit of a visualization of that. Okay, we've got the stream channel where we usually see the Colorado River. We have the base flood elevation, which is on the maps. It's in the, it's in the report. It's what everybody has been obsessing over. And then we have the, the floodway, which is that fast area. Then we have the floodway fringe. And what you're gonna see on these maps is where you have the blue stripe and then you have the, just the plain blue. It's all 100 year floodplain, but the blue is that floodway fringe. It's where the water's not as fast, it's not as deep, and we can probably put a house there and the foundation isn't gonna wash out on it, okay? I can tell you right now, we've got a lot of people, especially in certain subdivisions saying, can I build in here? Can I build in this fringe? Can I build in this 100 year floodplain? How high do I have to get? 18 foot? No problem. I want this property, okay? And we will say, you can build 18 feet up, but are you sure you want to do that? And then they say, yeah, I really like this property. We say, fantastic, okay? And we work with them. It is possible to build in 100-year floodplains. Other jurisdictions might say, no. You might go to the city of Austin, they may say, we're not allowing anybody to build in the 100-year floodplain anymore. So it's a, it's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction thing, okay? In Bastrop County, city of Bastrop, we do allow development in the 100-year in the floodplain, okay? Let's say you have somebody who, a big developer, okay? And they want to come in and they say, we're gonna put in this big subdivision and we know there's floodplain on it, but we're gonna do a letter of map revision. We're gonna, we're gonna model this floodplain out. We're gonna get some real eyes on it. We're gonna get some engineers on it. And then they're gonna come back and say, well, it was this big, but now it's only this tiny little sliver in this creek, okay? That's fine. That's a letter of map revision. So as a realtor, if you're looking at the national flood hazard layer, and you say, okay, there's floodplain here, but you know, you're thinking, okay, this is a new big subdivision. Maybe there's a letter of map revision on this. Okay, a good, a good example is the colony. The colony did a letter of map revision, and there are certain sections of it where it looks like it's floodplain, but then they did that letter of map revision, and they mapped, in the way they built the subdivision, maps out the floodplain, and so the, those homes are not actually in the floodplain, okay? And your lender is going to be looking at that, and if the lender isn't, make them aware. Are you yes. So if you go to FEMA Map Service Center, okay? All you got to do is search it on the internet, FEMA Map Service 
center, okay? And you can search by address, you can search by coordinate, you cannot search by parcel ID number because they do not have all of the central appraisal district numbers for the entire United States, okay? But you can use that repository to see, okay, where the floodplain is, and then you go to the Bastrop Central Appraisal District map, okay? And then you look on there, and you can start to put two and two together, okay? So you kind of have to use two maps in tandem. There's another exception. We don't see too many of these, but they're called a letter of map amendment, okay? And this is a per specific to a single property. A letter of map amendment states that that pro previous or current property owner has gone through the steps with FEMA to say, we're not actually in the floodplain because we're on top of a hill. And FEMA says, okay, we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that we mapped a hill into the floodplain. You don't have to be held to the floodplain management standards for the NFIP as if you were in a floodplain. We recognize that you are outside of the floodplain. Okay, so you may run across some existing homes that might be in the floodplain, but they have what they call a letter of map amendment or a LOMA, in which case the lender's not gonna require flood insurance, okay? Which means that property, the new buyer is not, if they put in something new, they may, they may or may not have to build to our standards, okay? It depends on how the LOMA's written. Once a LOMA is in place and it's an existing structure, you don't need an elevation certificate uh, for by a surveyor because they're not gonna be required to get flood insurance. Does that, does that make sense? No. <laughs> okay. All right, you have an existing structure on a hill that's in a flood plain. Uh-huh. So the best way to do that, so he's asking, we have a home on a hill in a floodplain. How do we go about doing a letter of map amendment? Best way is you get a surveyor involved. If it's for, but not for the elevation certificate, to, do, to prove other elevations around the property and an elevation certificate would be helpful, but it's not required. Mm -hmm. still a topo map of the property saying, showing the elevation of the house is above the flood level. Right, okay. right. And so uh, how do you prove what the flood level is? We're going to get into that in a little later, okay? Speaking of elevation certificates, okay, uh, how many of y'all have had to deal with elevation certificates in your transactions? Okay, we've got a handful. Uh, how many of y'all have never heard of an elevation certificate and this is all kind of new? No? Okay. So an elevation certificate is something that we use for regulatory purposes, okay, as part of uh, our ability to understand is this property, is this structure high enough? And then flood insurance is going to use it to rate the, the home for the premium, okay? That's the old way for rating insurance. The new way says you don't have to have an elevation certificate to rate your structure. Under risk rating 2.0, that's no longer necessary. However, it is very helpful you want to you want to save your buyer a couple thousand dollars, maybe five thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars a year. Have them spend the however many hundreds of dollars it is to get the elevation certificate, because it's going to have 
really great information on it that they can then put into the system to a, apply a, a really reasonable premium, okay? So, I guess I lied. So with Aloma, you do need an elevation certificate. I'm sorry, okay. Um, let's see here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna transfer this over to Allison. She's gonna explain a little bit about the map itself. This, what you're seeing here is the map changes viewer. And she's gonna talk specifically about uh, the city of Bastrop and the changes that have occurred there, okay? All right, so the city of Bastrop has studied Gills Branch and Piney Creek Bend to a much more detailed level than was previously done. Um, the currently effective maps use approximated information. We now have very specific, very detailed information on these areas. So there's some pretty significant areas of change here. All right, so this image here is Gills Branch. Um, we have Highway 95 along the right-hand side of the image. We have State Highway 71 along the bottom. This line is the railroad tracks, all right? This is the Performing Arts Center and Cedar Street. In the middle is, Ch is uh, Chestnut Street, and this is Farm Street, okay? The railroad acts as a barrier to Gills Branch. Um, there is a relatively small bridge opening down by 71. And so in heavy rain events, the water actually gets bottlenecked at that bridge and backs up. All right, and so many people who have lived in this area or who are in this area frequently can tell you in, in very heavy rains, there's a lot of water moving across the ground. Those areas flood. There's always water on my property, on my neighbor's property. People know this. Well, now the data backs that up, okay? And so more of this area is going to be in the regulated floodplain area. Um, the yellow area there has been added to the 100-year floodplain, that 1% annual chance, um, which as you can see is a pretty significant area. And the purple area has gone from 100-year to 500-year. So it's actually decreased a little bit. And that's just based on better modeling with better data along the creek. Piney Creek is another area of pretty significant change. Um, with better data there, uh, we see an increase in the 100-year floodplain in these yellow areas. Um, the yellow and black checked area here is an increase in 500-year floodplain. Um, and so there is an, an increase in properties that will need regulatory compliance there as well. This is one of the examples of um, change in the county. Uh, this is Cedar Creek. Yeah. Okay. So to kind of get your bearings on this, we've got 71 right up here, and then it turns off, and then we got 21, and then 21 comes down, and then keeps going. Okay. So we got Cedar Creek kind of parallels 21 for a little ways. You're going to notice that over here where 21 gets close to Cedar Creek, that's a regulatory floodway. This floodway is on a number of fairly large tracks, uh, but what we're seeing is that there are a lot of big tracks getting subdivided, split up, okay? And so you may be, as a realtor, asked to come in and sell off one of these tracks as a, as a somebody who may focus on larger tracts of land instead of, you know, single quarter acre site built or whatever your niche is. Okay, you're also going to notice that there's considerably more uh, floodplain along Cedar Creek. Okay. So, which are the areas that are affected by this particular map change? Not all of the county is changing. And in fact, even along some of these creeks, no, nothing is changing up at the, the, I guess you could say the higher ends, the, the, the headwaters of these creeks, okay? 
but you're going to have Cedar Creek. Okay, with the regulatory floodway expanded just a little bit. It does not include Walnut Creek and all of its tributaries. However, we are doing work to have Walnut Creek included in a future map change. Okay, we've got Dry Creek. There's about four or five Dry Creeks in Bastrop County. This particular one is the one towards the county line, Travis County line. Okay. Uh, we've got Gaisley Creek, which is Smithville. We've got Willow Creek at Smithville, Piney Creek at Bastrop, Gills Branch at Bastrop. And so what you're noticing here is that the, the, the towns are what's changing. Okay, Smithville getting some big changes. Bastrop getting some big changes. Okay, and you see this really long uh, website down here at the bottom. Okay, that's, that's the map that allows you to see exactly this, to see those changes. It's kind of hard to look at a map like what we have on the wall, look at the regulatory and kind of compare the two and put, to get, put the two together. It's kind of like those Sunday comics, what's the difference between the two? Okay. So we're providing you this, e this uh, website address to be able to find that viewer. Okay, so this is a map, a drawing, if you will, that shows all of the different tributaries, rivers, creeks in the county. I know y'all can't really read it, but what it basically shows in a very simplified manner is the areas that have been studied and which I've already mentioned, okay? The important thing to note is this is not the only map change coming. We're doing watershed studies as we speak, okay? We've done Walnut Creek. We've done, we just finished Wilbarger Creek. We're about to start Big Sandy Creek. We've done Alum Creek. We're about to do Pin Oak Creek. And then a few of these other creeks through here where we just have a little bit and then the other counties have the majority, okay? We're working with Texas Water Development Board to do these studies. Why is this important? Because as we do those studies, they're going to be included into future map changes, and they're actually going to kickstart this process again. So I know that we're in the process right now of the recommendation to FEMA for the next phase of map revisions. Okay, and so it's going to include Will Barger. It's going to include Alum Creek. And these are, some, these are gonna be major changes. We're talking about over probably half the county is gonna change and three quarters of the county is gonna change in the next five, 10 years, okay? So you need to keep your eye out for these changes that are coming. And they're good changes because we're providing better information to the public. We're providing better information to the lenders and to the flood insurance program as a whole. Okay, so this is a slide that has links to various resources uh, for floodplain management. I've already mentioned one, the Map Service Center. In the Map Service Center, you're gonna see several different products. You're gonna see the National Flood Hazard Layer, which is the NFHL. Okay, then you're going to see, you're going to want to also click on all products when you, when you search for a property, and then it's going to show you amendments, revisions, validations, and, and all of the official FEMA changes like a LOMA are all going to be right there. So you can search for a property, you can see what FEMA has on file, and you can make a really good determination right then and there. Not a whole lot of digging. Some digging, but not a whole lot of digging. Okay, so far as Bastrop County's management website, uh, all you have to do is search for Bastrop County Floodplain Management. We're the first thing that comes up. And there's a lot of great information there. I encourage you, if you have a client who is looking to buy in a floodplain, have them look at this website. They're gonna learn a lot. Okay, and also we have a link here 
to the Bastrop Central Appraisal Map. Okay, that's what we're, it has the floodplain maps on it. And that's my recommendation to y'all is use that Bastrop Central Appraisal Map as, to the best of your ability. It's gonna have the most accurate maps. You know, there might be some map revisions that are not gonna be on there. But far as the National Hazard Layer, the standard, you're gonna be able to see the property line and the floodplain line. Yes, ma'am. So uh, Bastrop Central Appraisal was just here in the last session, and we were talking about that. It has not been updated to have the preliminary, but from the sounds of it, they're going to be working on that. Okay. They, you also have to understand they use a third-party uh, mapping company for, for that particular service, and so Bastrop Central Appraisal is not going to be the ones to personally handle it. They have to pass it off to the to the third party consultant. I could not tell you. Unfortunately, we just had that conversation. My recommendation is to use that map changes viewer, use the the preliminary maps until we get something up. Okay. Any other questions regarding maps? Okay. Uh, Another great general resource is FEMA's website about floodplain management, about flood insurance. And the Bastrop CAD map is your, probably your number one resource. Your number two resource is the FEMA Map Service Center. Why is the map C, map, flood, FEMA Map Service Center the most important? Because you can take that determination to closing and it's legally binding. So if you have a, a seller that says, no, it's not in the floodplain, and then you have a buyer that says, yeah, it's in the floodplain, and you have that disagreement, you can take the firmet, the report that you print from Map Service Center, and you can say, here's FEMA's determination. This is legally binding. You want to go to court? Okay. And then we have that preliminary map changes viewer. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it off to Allison to talk a little bit about the appeals for if you see something on these maps, you're like, wait a second, doesn't quite add up. All right, so these are preliminary maps. They are not adopted and effective yet, right? Um, we are in the process of adopting these. The, process, the step in the process we're in right now is the appeal period. It started last Thursday, September 30th, um, and it will be open for 90 days. So what that means is appeals are formal written objections to what you see on the maps. So if you are incredibly familiar with an area and you're looking at these maps and you're going, you know, that just doesn't quite look right, um, you can do an appeal. These appeals must be documented and analyzed with scientific evidence showing that the information is scientifically or technically incorrect, okay? This doesn't mean you look at the map, you don't like what you say, what it says, and you wanna argue with it. Um, this is FEMA requesting technical information on why it's wrong and looking for the best information possible, okay? Um, if you do have documentation that supports an appeal, so maybe you have incredibly accurate topographic information, uh, maybe you believe the model was, uh, had some incorrect assumptions or something along those lines, um, you can submit a request with all that supporting information. If you're inside the city limits, if that property is inside the city limits, you'll submit that to the City of Bastrop Planning Department. If you are outside Bastrop City Limits, you will submit that to the Bastrop County judge or to the floodplain administrator. And so once you submit that to either of our entities, uh, we will review it, see if we agree, and then pass that on to FEMA. Uh, FEMA requires us to put a statement um, whether we agree or disagree so that when they conduct their analysis, they can take that into consideration. Yes, ma'am. If the question was, what if you're in the ETJ? So if you are in the ETJ, you would be considered in the county for these purposes. Thank you. You're welcome. 
All right, so once we get through the appeal period, uh, FEMA will analyze all of the appeals received. They will uh, resolve each and every appeal um, and provide a resolution letter to us and we will forward that on to the appellant. Um, they will revise the maps as appropriate. Uh, so if you provided some really great data, uh, they will take that into consideration and revise. If they don't believe it was helpful or didn't significantly change anything, they may not update the map. Um, and then once they finalize all the map revisions, they will send a letter of final determination. So they will send a letter to the city and to the county and say this is the final determination. Uh, these are the maps and they will be effective six months from that date. And at that point, the city and the county will reevaluate their uh, flood damage prevention orders, their ordinances, their codes, um, make sure everything is in line, make any updates or adjustments as needed, and adopt the maps. Any questions on how that process works? No? Okay. All right, so we have some pop, you know, different groups of people that um, are differently affected by this. And so we have some information here for any surveyors or engineers that are present. Uh, they may see an increase in requests for elevation certificates um, or thanks to some, some new reg regulations that just went out. Uh, in some cases, they may see a decrease in certain types or why uh, people are requesting elevation certificates. Um, if you're in the city, there will be more people that need floodplain development permits. Floodplain development permits are required prior to any building permits. So if you're looking at a client who's looking at a piece of property and they're like, you know what, I really like this house, but I need a garage for additional cars or I want to build a workshop in the backyard. Not only are you going to need a permit for that workshop, you also need a floodplain development permit for that workshop. And so what we look for is um, what flood zone are you in? What are the regulatory requirements in that flood zone? Um, if you're putting in a portable shed, how is it anchored? You know, and so when you're doing a normal building permit, you have a certain set of criteria and things that we're looking for. There may be additional requests for information with the floodplain permit just so that we can verify that it is going to be stable, not float down the creek and damage other people's property. Um, we also have some information on what the best available data is. I'll just breeze through that since most of you guys aren't the ones actually preparing the flood elevation certificates. Um, but you, we are gonna be looking for the flood insurance studies, the letters of map revision, um, preliminary flood insurance studies, the detailed studies, those are some of the ones Avram was talking about earlier. You know, we're studying every single, well, a lot of major creeks and going through the county and trying to get as best information as possible. Uh, and so when that information is available, we want to use it. Uh, base level engineering, that is available countywide. And so in areas that have not been studied, that is a fantastic place for information, and I'm going to let Abram explain that one because that applies way more to the county than it does to the city. Okay, so about a year ago, y'all may have noticed that on the Bastrop Central appraisal, there were two maps. One was the regulatory map, and the other one was kind of what they called the Bastrop County map, and they were different. We've since taken it down for a very good reason, okay, because people thought they had to regulate to that map. What that map was, was base level engineering. It's used for planning purposes, it's not for regulatory purposes. Okay, we can use some of that information to obtain elevation data, but far as if my home is outside of the FEMA flood insurance rate map, but it's inside that base level engineering, we're only going to hold you to if you're inside the base, the uh, flood plain, the flood insurance rate map, okay? Where this gets tricky is that FEMA has called this data set the estimated BFE viewer, okay? 
They didn't make it very clear as far as this is base level engineering, don't use this for regulatory, Here, go use your regulatory information. Okay. So if you're out there and you have a client that says, well, I was looking at this base flood viewer, this BFE viewer, and it was showing that my house is in the floodplain, but you know I know it's not, or they're showing it, that it's outside the floodplain, but insurance is saying I am. It's because of this, okay? So if you have folks that ha bring those, that have those questions, feel free to send them our way. We'll, we'll be happy to help explain it to them, uh, but also just let them know they need to be looking at the MAP Service Center and not necessarily the estimated base flood elevation viewer, the estimated BFE viewer. Okay. Okay, so what does this mean for y'all? Do you would you like to take it back or okay. So you're gonna see more homes, more structures, more property in the floodplain. We've had a net positive. Some are gonna be outside the floodplain. Okay, some are gonna under, if somebody wants to do a major renovation on a home, they see something that's, maybe it's from the 60s, they see it as a fixer-upper, and they say there's some great opportunity here. Okay, you might wanna tell them, this might be considered a substantial improvement, and you're gonna have to permit for that substantial improvement. Okay, large remodels, if the home is flooded multiple times, if they need to rebuild, that's substantial improvement as well. Okay, they're gonna have to permit. So, another big change in this is what we call the newly mapped uh, f policy holders, okay? So if you have a property, let's say it's out in the Cedar Creek area, and they're wanting to sell it, and the property owner says, it's not in the floodplain, it's great, it's fantastic, you'll love it, and then they find out six months later, the lender comes back and says, you need flood insurance, and they go, what? And this is why, because they got mapped in, and somebody didn't tell them they were about to get mapped in, because when you redo the maps, there is a grace period, okay? So between now and when these maps go effective is considered the grace period. Once the maps go effective, no, there's, there's, there's no graciousness, there's no forgiveness in this. It's you've gotta get, if you're a lender, they're gonna say you've gotta get the flood insurance, but if you take advantage of the grace period, the buyer, the lender may get a better premium rate. And so it's to your advantage to go ahead and get the flood insurance if you know you're gonna be mapped in. And then that way there's no blind sides. There's nothing coming from the mortgage company saying, hey, by the way, and everybody is much more aware of the situation. It's just all around better. Okay. So when it comes to premiums, risk rating 2.0, this is the huge, huge change. Okay, this is the first time this has changed since the conception of the flood insurance program in 1968. They are no longer gonna be determining their premiums based on are you inside or are you outside the floodplain. Preferred policy is going away. You can't get a preferred policy anymore. It's all, it's gone from a classical floodplain view to an actuarial view. Think of it like auto insurance, okay? Used to be, I'm getting a car, I want X amount of coverage, okay, here's your rate. But nowadays, it's what color is your car? How much mileage do you have? Have you had any accidents? Did, uh, did it flood at some point, okay? And fl so f flood insurance is changing in that sense, like auto insurance changed. So now they're no longer looking at, am I above the base flood, am I below the base flood? They're looking at how far away are you from the river? How high are you relative to your neighbors? 
What kind of house do you have? What's it made of? Do you have prior claims? And there's about 25 different variables that they're using now. And they have this fancy smancy computer system that's gonna basically tell them, okay, we're gonna put in all these different parameters, here's your rate, okay? What this means for, po for property owners, policy holders, is that their premiums are going to change in a big way. So let's say, for example, you're right on the coast, you have a stilt house, and you're on Galveston Island, your premium is probably gonna go up, okay? Because you're at higher risk. But if you're out in San Angelo on the top of a hill, but you want to flood insurance anyways, your flood insurance is gonna go down. And so with risk rating 2.0, which went into effect October 1st, four days ago, folks are gonna have to find out, okay, what's my insurance rate really gonna be? It's no longer just gonna be a flat rate at $500 a year for preferred risk policy. It's gonna be dependent upon all these other variables. Your, your neighbor, you might pay 600 bucks a month under the new system, but your neighbor who's farther down the down closer to the creek might pay 800 bucks a month. And so it's become much more personalized. And it's become much harder to tell people exactly how much they're going to pay. Okay. There are some general rules that you can follow to help people understand how to best plan for their flood insurance premium rates. And it's a little bit of common sense. The higher up you build, the cheaper it's going to be relative to the land around you and relative to your neighbors. The farther away you are from the creek, the higher up you are away from the creek, the cheaper your rates are going to be. The more sturdy of a house you have, the cheaper the rate's going to be. The more um, mitigation measures that you put into place let's say flood venting underneath the house or berms around the house or any number of things that you can do, those are gonna reduce your premium. They didn't used to. It was just your rates are rate and that's what you're gonna pay regardless of how much you do to your house. They're starting to acknowledge people who care about their houses, who wanna protect them, they're gonna give them lower rates. Okay, so my recommendation is Contact your insurance agent. Contact your lender. If you have a preferred lender that you use, let them know, hey, have you learned about this risk rating 2.0? What should I be prepared for from y'all? The documentation is going to change a little bit too. The, the base forms are going to be the same, but a lot of that uh, underwriting is going to change just a little bit. Okay. Um, now let me be clear that the floodplain management rules are not changing. So if the county says you still need to be to XY elevation, you still got to be to XY elevation. Okay. Where this becomes handy though is elevation certificates. Part of the reason they went to this new system is to help enable property owners to be able to get flood insurance without having to spend the extra money for an elevation certificate which can be some hundreds of dollars. My recommendation is still get the elevation certificate because it's gonna help, it's gonna cover its own cost in the premium rate within a few years, but it's not required. So because of the information that's provided in it is valuable to setting the premium, but it's no longer required. So if you have an existing home they, that they want to get an, ele an elevation certificate, that's fine if it's for flood insurance, but you're also going to find that the lender is going to say, we don't have to have this elevation certificate anymore as part of our lending process because they, of this new system. Okay, So my recommendation is get one to cover your basis, especially from a regulatory standpoint, um, but know that your lenders may not be mandating it 
anymore. Okay. Uh, another thing to consider is that we participate in a community rating system, which is a, su a sub program of the National Flood Insurance Program. And basically, what that means is as a community, as a county, as a city, as, as we do more to help educate, protect, and regulate the floodplain, the more of a discount the policyholder gets. So, Bastrop County, we're at a class eight, which means that every policyholder receives a 10% discount off their premium rate, right off the top, okay? Which is great. In the old, because of risk rating 2.0, it was limited to only homes within the floodplain. Now, it's to everybody. So homes outside the floodplain can now also take advantage of the discount, which I think is fantastic, okay? Okay, some things to remember is, are you improving your property? Do you plan to improve your property? If the answer is yes, whether it's some drainage work, a new barn, a new house, a mother-in-law suite, a pool, Think about permits. You're probably going to need a development permit, even if it's outside the floodplain, before you do it. Okay. Okay. Some other things to remember: it is hurricane season. We do. We are in flash flood season. While it's not the peak, we still this time of year do get flash floods. Turn around, don't drown. And I can tell you, we do have flash flooding here in Bastrop County. I saw it firsthand earlier this year in May when creeks went from zero to 19 foot in three hours. Okay, a fresh reminder, only 6% of homes in the floodplain in Bastrop County have flood insurance. Let's try to boost that number. Let's educate because that 6% accounted for $3.6 million in claims. And I would love to see more people take advantage of the program to be able to rebuild, okay? If you have a client or you yourself live near a creek, a river, a low-lying area, a gully, let's think about it. Your property's, that structure might be subject to flooding. If you're looking at a home and you're thinking, I could probably sell this for X amount of dollars, but you see that there might be these issues, you might want to raise a red flag, you might want to cause them to do a little due diligence and just be sure that what they're getting into is the deal that you're trying to negotiate. Okay? Don't be a pollute, don't pollute. Keep your culverts clear. So try to keep, you know, dumping trash, uh, putting fill in on your property, and then it just washing off into the culverts. Let's try to avoid that as much as possible, okay? Because the roads depend on it, your homes depend on it, water backing up because of some trash is just not a good situation, and it's just, it's just nasty. So uh, with that, do y'all thank you for your time. We'll open it up for questions, and uh, thank you all for coming. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Correct. These maps are not all part of Bastrop County. It's most of it, though. These are the maps that are being changed. I think it's about two thirds of it of the maps that are being changed, at least a little bit of them. Yeah. Any other questions? This is your chance. Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and that's provided by FEMA, and it's not going to have the parcel lines on it, but it, it, it is useful. Yes, yes, 
And another thing to consider is that while the base level engineering is not the regulatory information, if you compared it with the way the new maps are playing out, it's similar. So if you have a property owner that's saying, what's the new map going to look like, but we haven't done the work yet to produce the new maps, you could point them to the base level engineering BFE viewer and say this might be what it could look like in the future. All right. Anybody else? No? Nope. All right. Thank you all, guys. Have a good one.